Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by Fred and Lou Hartwig and viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. And our topics tonight, Sam and Sly, an odd couple, politics and sex, not such an odd couple, <laughs> and a couple of Supreme Court rulings bolster Obama. But we start with our newsmaker segment and talk about the Missouri leg of Interstate 70 and its current state of disrepair. Neither voters nor legislators have seemed eager to address the problem, and the chairman of the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission simply says, we don't have a plan, we don't have the money, we are looking for ideas. Here to shed more light on the issue is Chairman Stephen Miller. Mr. Chairman, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for joining us. Mike, great to be with you. What's the function, major function of the commission? So the commission is a group of six individuals that are appointed by the governor of the state and confirmed by the Senate. And they have essentially all executive authority to establish uh, policy and direction and make all decisions regarding the governance of the Missouri Department of Transportation. Let's talk about I-70 for a moment. What are the major problems? I'm sure many viewers will know them, but in your uh, estimation from your position as chairman, what are the major problems? Well, certainly your viewers are going to know if they've driven between Kansas City and St. Louis that they see that there's a lot of congestion and a lot of trucks, and it's not a very enjoyable driving experience. Now, what they probably don't know is that Interstate 70 was the very first interstate to be constructed starting in 1957. And when it was built, it was designed to only last 50 years. Simple math will tell you we've exceeded those 50 years. And what the viewers can't see is they may see a fairly smooth roadway out there right now, uh, but the material below that, which is the 18 inches or so that actually supports the bed of that, is completely deteriorated and is in need of replacement. So we literally have to go in and tear out I-70 down to the bare ground and rebuild it. And if we don't, it's going to continue to deteriorate over time, causing delays for drivers as we try and do patchwork repairs and not be as safe a roadway as we would like it to be. Well, the same kinds of problems you experience with bridges. Absolutely. Is that in your jurisdiction too? Do you oh, yeah. With bridges? We have uh, 10,400 bridges in the state of Missouri. And right now, just under 600 of those are in critical condition. And we estimate that if we don't get more funding, that in a decade's time, it'll be about three times that much, almost 1,500 bridges. Well, to deal with these problems on I-70, and since it appears the legislature is not going to give you the money, and the public would not vote to increase taxes to give you the money, uh, you've gone to the public to ask for help. What's that all about? Well, you're exactly right. We know that we have to rebuild I-70, as I said, down to the ground and build it back up. And we have a couple issues that we have to face with that. First of all, just from a practical standpoint, if we're going to rebuild this roadway, it shouldn't be a roadway of the 1950s. It should be the 21st roadway uh, of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And we also hope that in inviting ideas of what that roadway ought to look like, uh, that we're going to find possible new sources of revenue. So one of the examples that I use with people is I hold up my cell phone. And I say, 20 years ago, this was nothing more than a telephone. And no one at the time could imagine what we all see today. And that is a phone that may hold hundreds of apps, that may be a revenue generator that changes the way we all function. Well, this device is just an exchange of ideas. The transportation system is an exchange of goods and people. And I'm confident that when we look back 20 years from now, people will say 20 years ago they saw this only as a roadway. Now this does so much more. And what we're trying to figure out right now is what is that so much more going to be for our roads? And, and you've got a way people can uh, write to you and make comments, offer suggestions? Absolutely. We have opened this up. We've said to the entire world, literally, in this uh, transnational market that we're in, 
is we're offering 200 miles of interstate highway in Missouri that's already environmentally cleared, that is ready to be constructed, and we're saying to the world, come here with your ideas about what this roadway should be. And so we have created a website uh, in which we're already collecting data. We announced this just a little over three weeks ago in Kansas City. Uh, we've had great response. We've had over a hundred different submissions come in. There are 30 that we're actively investigating. And yes, we are inviting uh, everyone, that's one of your viewers and everyone in the world to come and give us their ideas. Are you giving away prize money for the best ideas? Um, forever a, uh, a place in history. <laughs> uh, maybe a sign on I-70. There we go. And, and you've particularly designated the area from Independence to Wentzville. That is the road to tomorrow. Right. At least the, you hope it will be. The name that we have put is the road to tomorrow. And we hope that this is going to be not only the road to tomorrow for those 200 miles, but we are going to be a leader for the country and the, and the world as to what the new generation of highways well, should be. Good luck with that. Thank you for coming by. That, uh, that site again is MoDOT dot org slash road to tomorrow and our guest has been Stephen Miller chairman of the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission now let's meet the panel and see if we can start a ruckus Jason Grill is a former Missouri state representative and now runs J Grill Media Gwen Grant is president and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant, and Ron Freeman is the former executive director of the Kansas Republican Party and is now a motivational speaker and writer. Events of the past several weeks motivated the Star's political writer, Steve Kraske, to unveil an important similarity between two quite dissimilar elected officials, Kansas City Mayor Sly James and Kansas Governor Sam Brownback. He calls James King of Kansas City and Brownback King of Kansas. Let's start with James. Kraske points to Sly's tremendous 87% re-election victory last week and ponders whether it came about because James is so good a mayor, no one of substance would run against him, or whether his landslide victory was simply the result of minimal opposition from Vincent Lee, who barely campaigned. So Gwen, what's the right answer? The right answer is it's a combination of both. Uh, the mayor has done a great job <coughs> over the past four years. He uh, is a vast improvement over Funkhauser, who served only one term. And at the end of Funkhauser's term, there was an urgency to make a change. Now, with things going so well, there's no real urgency to make a change. And typically, mayors get a second term. Uh, uh, Lee did not run a uh, campaign really against the mayor and, and that's unfortunate because even with Kay Borns and other mayors who did have opposition it did raise the level of discourse so we did have an opportunity to uh, discuss issues Lee did not bring any of that forward and uh, so with with a huge war chest and with a, a good record in his first term why would anybody you know contend him they just like I'll wait raise some money and come when I won't have Jason any James is term limited unless we change the rules you think there's any chance that he's so popular there might be an effort to change the city charter and allow a third term for him uh, probably not I mean I think Mayor James has done a great job he's a, a great spokesman for Kansas City but I, I can't see that happening I mean maybe he comes back I mean I just it's not gonna happen I mean he's done a great job but now, there'll be a lot of people that'll be wanting to run in uh, the next mayor. What election. kind of role might he take on when he leaves office, do you think? Uh, you never know. Oh. I mean, I think he's a, a very uh, outgoing guy who people really liked. And, you know, he's a different type of politician, and maybe he'll do something with, uh, go back to being an attorney or get into something on the nonprofit I, side. I, I Is the mayor I, popular, Mary, do you think, because he's so visible, so omnipresent, and so amiable when he's out? I think those are the top three. We often underestimate the power of personality in politics, and if there is ever a mayor of, the, of uh, Kansas City, Missouri, that just exudes optimism and strength, is a powerful speaking voice. He uh, works very hard. Coming from a mayor that refused to work, <laughs> refused, no, he refused to do the job, to a mayor that is working all day and every day, and doing such a great job of it, uh, I, it he's amazing. By the way, uh, <laughs> Mayor James will be our special guest on Ruckus two weeks from now. Let's go on to Governor Brownback. Kraske gives Sam the King destination because despite all the criticism he's received, he prevailed. And amazingly enough, Brownback got a conservative no legislature to raise the sales tax. 
So do you agree with Kraski that Sam is indeed the king of Kansas, Ron? I wouldn't say king of Kansas. I don't think he wants that title, but I do think he's kind of an, the empowerment king. You look at everything he's done, it's like, how do we put power into the hands of the private sector? How do we put power into the residents of Kansas and let them make the state what it can be, which is really a tip of the hat to self-determination in that state? Let me ask you another question. Uh, I think it's fair to say Brownback's image is not good right now. Is there any way you can think of that he could rehabilitate his image? Well, I just, you know, the fact is, anytime you initiate public policy, it's going to take time for that to come to fruition. You let it run its course. We've been in it for, what, maybe uh, a year of trying to make these changes, and now everybody expects it to, to have been well, done. It's been a little bit longer than so that. Uh, I think since 2013. Yeah, I think in time. Well, what about if, if revenue should increase dramatically over the next couple of years, right. and I don't know that it will, but, but let's say it mm -hmm. does, wouldn't that be a, an image change? Absolutely. I, mean, I think that's what happens. I mean, but that's a matter of process. I mean, you look at policy that was changed a year ago, and you, you said, well, nothing's happened yet. Well, give it time, and it will. I don't know, Ron, yeah. if that's a matter of process. It's a matter of reality and whether the, the, the economy responds to his negative influence on it. The realm of King Brownback is in disarray. Mary, you're a media. <laughs> Mary, we always introduce you as a media and communications yes, consultant. Let's say tax increases in terms of revenue down the road, notwithstanding. We don't know what's going to happen. But right now, if Brownback were to hire you and say, Mary, help me improve and enhance my image, what would you tell him? I'd say resigning Sunday wow. would be excellent. Uh, yeah. You know, this is not just, this isn't playtime here. The state of Kansas is in free fall in terms of its budget. And just this, just I guess yesterday or the Not day before, we found out that we found too? out that 20 million. Oh, there, the US let me, let me finish Thanks. my comment, Ron. We found out that, that they are 20 million, another 20 million uh, below the estimates of what they'll need just to pay the bills. Uh, to get by. That's with the tax increases. I have not heard a single person say they are happy about the massive increase in sales taxes, uh, uh, it, uh, various kinds of deductions that people were used to taking, and the inc incredible increased cost of rising property taxes that that's bringing about. His realm is in complete chaos, and he has stripped people of their rights, their future, and their economic well-being. Kraski and, and says, so, we got to wrap so, this up. Kraski, <laughs> Kraski wow, says dude. Brownback is the most consequential governor in the history of Kansas. Well, consequential can mean that. good or bad. Do you agree that he's the most consequential uh, it's, governor? It's just because it's right now. I don't know if he's the most consequential, but he's done a lot of interesting things the last four years, yeah. that's for sure. All right, let's move on. In a front page story, the Kansas cool. City Star reports dozens of women Current and former interns, legislative aides, lobbyists, and lawmakers say that lechery and harassment remain commonplace in Jefferson City, the state capital where legislation is written and laws are enacted. The lengthy article offers accounts of unending come-ons, of retaliation for sexual rejection, of false accusations that they must be sleeping with their boss. One former state senator is quoted as saying, the culture of Jeff City is very anything goes. Well, only one of our panelists has actually served in the Missouri legislature. So without implicating yourself, what can you tell us, Jason, about the accuracy of this I think, story? I think the, uh, you know, it's pretty serious what was written. I think there's a, some accuracy to it. I think there's some things that aren't accurate. I think that there's 197 members of the General Assembly. So uh, obviously there's a lot of good people down there and there's a lot of people doing great work. Uh, obviously there's some other stories that have came out. I think that uh, it's positive that there's reforms taking place. There's panels being formed for the uh, intern issue. There's uh, sexual harassment panels that'll be formed. I think those things are important. But I think throughout history, uh, we've seen that in politics, whether in any DC, Missouri, Kansas, there's issues like this because people are put into that box. And whether it's in a corporation too, how, we see- how, we long, see. how long were you there? <laughs> I was there for four years. All right, did you find this story shocking, surprising, something no. you couldn't possibly imagine? Not really. I mean, we hear about it all the time in government. I mean, in DC, this happens all the time. So I wasn't that shocked, Jason, obviously. What a cream puff response well, you know, to you know this, what, you know to what what's going really on. Needs to happen. We need to elect 
more women to Absolutely. the state legislature. Then you won't have all this sexting, well, now, let me ask you a all question. this harassing, uh, well, all these leftist Gwen, men running Gwen, amok if we elect well, more Gwen, women. only men uh, were mentioned in this article as <laughs> sexual predators, mm -hmm. but can't powerful women put uh, yeah. subordinate course, men in that well, same position? Well, I know you used to serve in the Iowa any, legislature. We don't have any reports When I was in the Iowa legislature, I was on the committee that controlled these kinds of things and, and the ethics part of it too. And we battled every day to figure out a way to do this. The only way for the women who work there to be free, Jason, of sexual harassment of a very serious sort, you didn't see, you, you saw a nice, Article. It wasn't very nice. I mean, it had lots right. of scandal yeah. in it. Yeah. But there's a lot more that that was not written. And you know what needs to happen is we have to have great reporters who bring these incidences to the public, so the public can punish the people back home. Well, I was going yeah, to say. I, 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 I was going to ask. Well, I want to say too much. We, we got to protect the people. Whoa, 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 whoa! We, we can't all be too. chatting at the same time. All right. What did you? All listen? parties need to be protected in this. Both the accuser and the accusee. There's a lot of safeguards out there for. Politicians really have not. I mean, anyone can say anything about anyone in public life. And, and isn't it true? Oh, it, it, is it not? It, is it not, what? Mary? <laughs> hang on. Is it not true, Jason, that women who face these kind of problems do have legal recourse, but often choose not to take it because they fear it's going to hurt their careers? I'm well, assuming, that. yes, that happens in many instances. Yeah. But I'm thinking we're, we're painting a broad brush here. I think about well, it sounds like Jeff a City. Well, and, 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 and Ron, like a Ron, Ron according to people who country. follow these things and commented for this article. They make a couple of points. Most of these problems are caused by a few people, not right. the majority. Sure. And not just in Jefferson City, but, but oftentimes oh. in state capitals around Washington, the Washington, Topeka, yeah, all over. But exactly. the thing is, the victim has to have a voice. There are people who are being used and taken advantage of, and they can't speak out because of, like, uh, advancement or promotions or job opportunities are going to be lost because of the nature of their, their work. And that's what's really patently unfair. The women there are powerless mm -hmm. in the, and spend every day working with the most powerful people they've ever met. And that, it, it, it's a den of iniquity, as Mike Grace would say. But, right. but it, it, really, much. really, Jason, yeah. women who are young and are working with powerful men over whom they have, they really, would you have stood up well, I, and defended one and taken on one no, of your No one's defending any, any of this. I'm just saying that it's good when the facts come out and we can hear from the people. You think a lot of women right. are accusing men and Jeff sitting as, uh, of doing things they don't do? Well, I never do? said that. Right. Good. No, I, it sounds like you're saying that, it's, it, that sure it could be fabrication and not necessarily well, true. never said that. But, and I said that's, it. but, it's that's well, but it's, a, it's a possibility, it's a possibility. is it not? I mean, women, men, people lie all the time. They and, do, and get but exposure. the reality is this it's just you know women what history has shown us is that if you do speak up you're gonna pay a severe price for it whether exactly. even if you do have representation and you look at what happened to Anita Hill when she spoke up against uh, against well, Clarence was, Thomas. Yeah. and you know that was what it, you know, so the it point well, is, it was it unproven, a, a it, yeah. unproven and allegations. She, and she was maybe attacked, she's just and attacked, and attacked. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what, yeah. But so, if you, that's the way it's always portrayed. Once a woman speaks up, the then they Hill. attack the people but with power, go on the offense. With the and Hill, it's still going on. It's still, with her. yeah, it's still, still going, going on. on, in spite of all the, the good life she's. All right, her. we're going to head on to another topic. Last week saw a sweeping action from the U.S. Supreme Court declaring that the right of same-sex couples to marry is guaranteed by, among other things, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Voter-approved constitutional bans on same-sex marriage in Missouri and Kansas were struck down by the High Court's decision. As opponents point out, the only way the same-sex marriage decision can be reversed now is by a constitutional amendment or by another ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court. So, Ron, are those Republicans opposed to this decision optimistic that either of those two things will occur in the foreseeable future <laughs> or ever? No, they're not optimistic. I think they're actually happy to have the issue off the table because now it's no longer, it's, it's done, it's decided. And you look at it and it's a matter of the majority of the Americans would say that we support what the court did. And so, you know, the only way you can circumvent that is, a, excuse me, is to take the minority and say, we're going to have our way. And any time in this country, you look at our history, when religion, in essence, is forced on people, which is what we're talking about here in a lot of ways, is there's revolt. How, did you get to religion? <laughs> How do you get to religion? What's the objection to gay marriage? What's the objection to gay marriage? 
this is about well, a civil. This is about equality under the law. But the object, no, his point is the object. No, he's right. The objection to gay marriage is based on biblical scripture. That's a Republican's position, right? Okay, so thank you very much for conceding. But we're talking about the separation of church and state and equality. Well, he was talking about opposition. He said the opposition is based on biblical scripture. Isn't that what you said? Yes. Then you would be right. Probably more important. Probably more important than the court's decision, Jason was the fact that the public had moved toward accepting gay people and gay marriage. Mm -hmm. And I would attribute that to younger people, and you're our millennial link on this program. <laughs> youngest, uh, do you think the younger generation for in sure. America led the way on all of this? I do think that has a lot to do with it. When I first ran for office, it was 04, and uh, it was overwhelming against gay marriage in my district. Uh, it's changed so much. I think people really came around to the equality issue of it. Everyone has gay friends, and uh, it's more of an equality issue. We're a secular society, and I feel like uh, this was coming, and it just happened pretty quickly, in my opinion. But right. it's an equality issue, it's Gwen, a justice issue more than. You know who I think <laughs> deserves thanks? Who is that? Ellen. DeGen Ellen DeGeneres. Yeah. I mean, she, well, <laughs> seriously, well, she did. when she, she came, came out. out uh, and she and paid had a popular the price TV when she program. first came out. I mean, she had her yeah. show, and she yeah. and, and, and it backfired oh, on her. Exactly. But and Will and Grace, she, right. the TV show. Yes, Will and Grace well, is a great What's show. been the importance of media, Mary? Oh, it, it can't be um, overestimated, actually. Starting back, actually, Jason, I would build on what your comment and Gwen's by saying that I, as, as negative as this is to recall, <clears throat> the AIDS struggle in this country really did bring thousands and thousands of American families uh, up front and personal experience of who it is in their family that is a gay person and may have been sick. And that great uh, tragedy uh, caused all kinds of organizations to, to come forward and to hear the stories of real gay people and their struggles for equality in this country. But I think you have to hand credit to, uh, I don't know, going all the way back to Elizabeth Taylor and her standing up for Rock Hudson and, and, and then on to there. But Ellen DeGeneres is, I'm gay, into the microphone at the airport yeah, yeah. was about it. Rosie O'Donnell, of course, and all well, kinds Mary, of Mary, what's people. next for the LGBT activists now that gay marriage has been resolved? Well, I think it's true, and I, I bet all of us would agree here that you can get married on Sunday and fired on Monday, that there still is not any... Right? That's the big issue. An effort still, to get gay people or LGBT there still people is no a protected law class. In the state of Kansas or any other. And the, there's no U.S. law either. No U.S. That law. A, that's, you're that's, talking about making that a protected class along with age, religion, color. Law discrimination color. against well, gay people yeah. because they are gay. Well, you have to that's have an anti discrimination law. You have to have them in yeah, a right. protected yeah, class. Ideally, it would go under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and I think that's a possibility 10 years from now. All I right, 10 years. Jason, you're an attorney. I mean, you don't practice law necessarily, but <laughs> I do a little bit, you do some. Well, you've been to law <laughs> school. Constitutional lawyer. You, you've been to, <laughs> well, we're going to find out. Uh, you've oh, been gosh. to law school, but let me ask you this. Uh, are there legitimate criticisms, notwithstanding people liking this decision by the court, but legitimate criticisms of the way the court reached its decision on same-sex marriage? There's no federal law supporting gay marriage, right? And uh, there is no reference in the Constitution anyone can find to marriage, straight or gay. Right. So how does the court arrive at this kind of a judgment? They, they arrived at it because 36 states had, had come to the conclusion that it was fine. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of uh, legal implications of it, but it just became one of those things where they had tried the cases throughout the process. and. It, We've all seen the rights we appear about. over time right, right, right. That, that aren't mentioned in the Constitution but derived from something that is that's written right. in the Constitution. That's right. Well, the 14th Amendment is where they got it, Mike, and the 14th Amendment's insistence on due process of law. It does, and equal protection. And equal protection. protection of the law. Equal protection if is you can right. get married, equal protection of the law. I can get married. But now they're talking about uh, the right of dignity which yes. is another yeah, right that I, I don't where, think where is, is established yeah, by the right. Constitution, at least that? not in writing, but right. is, no, is justice, assumed by, but by people. Okay, uh, we're going to move on because it is time now for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckheads speak up and speak out about people and events in the news. And Jason is up first. Thank you, Mike. I'd like to toast the 
8% of voters who voted in uh, Platte County, Clay County, and the 13% who voted in Jackson County in our recent municipal elections. Uh, thank you for going out and voting. More people need to vote. We have important issues to settle here in Kansas City. Politicians and candidates work extremely hard to uh, talk to voters, and uh, I'm hopeful that in the future we'll have more voters. But to those who voted in the last municipal election, thank you for voting, and uh, please get your neighbors out to vote next time. Mary. Last Friday, when I first heard that the Supreme Court Justice Kennedy had led the court to a 5-4 decision in favor of marriage equality, I knew for the first time that my best friend, my partner in life, Monica Breidenbach, and I would be free to marry and to live in Kansas with full citizenship, full equality under the law, and as Kennedy wrote, equal dignity in the eyes of the law. Today is Monica's birthday, so my toast today is for her. The greatest honor of my life has been your decision to spend the rest of your lives with me. Because of the courts and countless friends and supporters and the 14th, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, we can celebrate today a freer, fairer, and more dignified life in the eyes of the law and everyone we love. Congratulations, Mary. Thank uh, you. Gwen. I'm toasting President Barack Obama for an excellent, phenomenal past two weeks, uh, during which he uh, was successful on his trade bill, he was victorious uh, with the Supreme Court ruling on the Affordable Care Act, with the passage of uh, the Supreme Court's decision on equality for same-sex marriage, and then his spirit-filled eulogy of Reverend Dr. Clementa Pinckney in, on last Friday in Charleston, South Carolina. Job well done, Mr. President. Ron. Okay. I'd like to toast Noel Wilson and his family, the young Royals fan, and fought courageously, lost him this week, but they're such an example to, uh, to us as a community. Uh, he turned his tragedy into a blessing for others through his colorful Band-Aid campaign that's already impacted thousands. And I just want to say God bless the Wilson family and appreciate their example of courage, faith, and love. And finally, here's a rose to those, well, I don't have time for that rose. I've just seen it disappear from the teleprompter. So I'll do this next time. And that is ruckus for this week. Uh, we're away next week, but back the week after that with uh, Mayor James as one of our guests in the first segment of the program. Now on behalf of the Ruckettes and the Ruckus crew, this is Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching. Have a great 4th of July weekend, and we'll see you two weeks from now.